today we have Jared Spiewak on the show and I'm super excited about this because uh, <clears throat> we talk about um, spending money on marketing and, and really it's such a, such a hot topic because there's so much uncertainty in it. And I know that you probably get this a lot, Jared, but <clears throat> I run into with my own service business, people always are throwing a pitch at me. It's like, mm -hmm. Do Facebook ads, do, you know, LSA, do this, do that. And so I'm always like, yeah, but if I spend a grand here, two grand there, five grand here a month, um, how do I know that that's going to be, how do I know that that's a measure, how do I get a measurable ROI for that? And then whenever I run into like, um, I hear some pe some contractors and they're like, <clears throat> here's my numbers on Facebook, you know, my revenue was half a million dollars this month just from Facebook ads and stuff. And then my LSA was only a hundred, uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or $10,000. And so like, and then other people are like, just use Facebook for uh, brand, you know, creating a brand and everything, you know, mm -hmm. association, everything like that. So I'm super excited to talk to you today and mainly about, um, kind of the biggest mistakes that are made by service companies whenever they first start out. So with that being said, kind of a long intro, welcome to the show, Jared. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Sweet. So tell me a little bit about you and your background and, and how you got into all of this. Yeah, sure. So let me give you the, the quick version. So uh, who I am is I'm the founder and lead strategist of Blue Dog Media. We're a marketing agency that helps uh, exceptional service-based businesses essentially make more money with ROI-centric marketing campaigns so that you can basically worry less about what your marketing is doing and focus more on actually building and growing your business without all the typical agency BS. So that's kind of the elevator pitch, pitch, if you will. In terms of me personally, so I got started in this very young, I was 14 and I was graduating high school early. I finished, I started going to college at 15, graduated high school at 16. Nice. And I had to figure out how to make money because I had to, whatever loans didn't cover, I had to pay for myself. We weren't, uh, we weren't, you know, financially well enough so I could just like spend a bunch of money on college and not have to worry about it. So I Googled how to make money online. This eventually led me to writing online. Very, very little uh, money, basically like a penny a word. Uh, and so making a couple bucks, learning about this online stuff, a lot of people wanted uh, marketing related content, mainly SEO. So if anyone's familiar with that, you know that content's very important with it. So everyone's asking for this SEO content. I'm like, what is that? I looked into a little bit. I was like, all right, cool. This sounds interesting, but whatever. And then eventually I got, uh, I got hired by a local uh, real estate corporation to join their marketing team. And very quickly I learned that the corporate world, really not for me, couldn't really stand it to be honest. So I looked back into some of the other marketing stuff that I learned about, uh, mainly SEO, started teaching myself. I started working for $5 an hour just to kind of gain experience. I wasn't really worried about the money at that point. Started uh, my Initially, I was mainly actually working with contractors, a scrap metal uh, mm -hmm. uh, removal company, if that's the right terminology there. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, from there, I actually got a pretty nice offer from an agency making double what I was at the corporate job. So I did that for about two years while freelancing on the side. And eventually I had more and more uh, side work. So it went from full time to part time to no time at the agency. It had all these clients. I was like, what's next? I guess I'll start my own agency. And here we are two years later. Yeah. So how have you liked that experience, that transition um, going from basically learning SEO to now having your own agency? It's great, mainly because I'm a really bad employee. <laughs> so so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm someone that uh, I'm always looking to, uh, I'm a big believer in like systems, processes, automation. So I'm always looking to do do the same work much faster and much less time. But as a employee that does hourly work, that means you make less money. So there's the incentive to do things much slower and to basically pad your hours. I'm also someone that's always looking to improve things. And so I, I was always someone that was like, okay, great. Here's, here's these big issues I can see even in departments that I'm not in. Here's how we need to fix this. And, you know, okay, great. You know, here's just some idiot in our, in our uh, company that just has all these ideas. So I was like, cool, well, if you don't want to listen to me. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just go and implement all this stuff in my own company. And then, you know, here we are. So it was, uh, it was something worthwhile. I was very hesitant for it. I probably, I probably could have made the jump about six to eight months prior to when I did, but it was, it was very, uh, uh, 
very hesitant to do so just because I was very, very risk adverse at the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, that that uncertainty is the reason why a lot of uh, technicians who are considering becoming business owners, mm -hmm. which are a lot of our listeners, they are really um, hesitant, like you said, risk adverse because, I mean, they have a cush job or a relatively cushion job pretty much guaranteed hours, especially if you're an mm -hmm. HVAC service tech, because we do, a, there's a lot of HVAC guys that listen, guys and gals that listen to this, um, or plumbers and electricians. And so like you, you know that you're going to get your hours in, but then you go off, do your own thing. And you have stuff like marketing that you haven't ever had to do before, mm -hmm. unless you're in the office side of things before you start your business. But you have a lot of crazy overhead items that you haven't ever had to deal with before. So uh, that uncertainty is definitely on the top of a lot of people's mind before starting their own business. So um, with that being said, kind of what are some of the biggest mistakes that you're seeing uh, service business uh, companies make uh, when it comes to marketing type things? Yeah. So the two most common mistakes that I see are not tracking how well things are going. And what I mean by tracking is tracking completely, not just how many clicks you're getting, but from the point of the click to the actual dollars being in your bank account, being able to track and being able to look at like your P and L's at the end of the month, quarter, whatever it may be and go, okay, great. I know exactly where that $20,000 that 50,000, a hundred thousand, that million came from and tying that back to an individual click. Now, that's one thing is tracking things as detailed as possible. Pretty much nobody has that, that I talk to, whether they do a hundred thousand a year or 15 million a year, basically nobody has it set up in the service-based uh, businesses. Uh, now, the other thing is focusing on actually improving your ROI beyond just, uh, you know, they can, you know, this other company that I hire can worry about that. So what I mean by that, and that was a very general and broad statement is, uh, what I see a lot is somebody goes, uh, and I, I can get way more detailed into this, but uh, very simply, somebody goes, you know what, we need to make more money. Our ROI of this marketing campaign isn't high enough. We're not getting enough volume from it, whatever it may be. So we need to get clicks for cheaper. Uh, we need to get, uh, we need to get uh, conversions at a higher rate from our clicks. But what they don't realize is that their, the person that's answering their phone mm. misses 30% of their phone calls. Mm -hmm. And they were to simply answer the phone they would be able to make progress today rather than us run tests for the next three, four months to make marginal improvements because we're already doing pretty good in those fronts. Yeah. So kind of being blindsided in what areas you actually have to optimize. So those are the two things, tracking and improving your ROI and the, I categorize it in four or five different areas that actually matter and not just get more traffic. So here's a, the challenge that I have personally when it comes to tracking in general. So we have good CRMs and they will track things pretty well, but it's, to me, it's, um, somebody may see a billboard or they may see a van mm -hmm. and then they Google us to find our phone number. And then, so when it, they call in, they're calling in on the call tracking number that's possibly mm -hmm. Google or maybe it's our website header um, phone number. And so then Google and the website are getting credit for something, maybe a van or a Facebook ad or something like that was actually the, the one that actually did mm -hmm. all the work. Um, how do you, how do you rule that out? I mean, is it just sure. asking every single time they call or do you have a different method of that? Sure. So this is, this is where we get into what's called uh, multi-channel attribution, which is that the way that someone initially finds you is not necessarily the way that they'll contact you. Mm -hmm. So if anyone's run remarketing campaigns beforehand, you'll be very familiar with this. Somebody came to your website because of SEO, and then because they came to your website, that triggered your Facebook ad to then show to them, and you only show your Facebook ad to people who have been to your website. So if they call you from your Facebook ad, that'll be tracked as your Facebook ad, but they never would have seen that ad if they didn't land on your website from your SEO in the first place, right? So right. people can come in multiple different ways. So one, yes, you can ask, you know, hey, where did you find us? How do you find us? Honestly, it's not very reliable. Uh, I would put a note in there, but because people, uh, people aren't gonna notice that the reason why they decide to call you is that they drove by your billboard 
20 times in the past you know week and that just mentally they've recognized your brand name so when they googled you even though you ranked number two they decided to click on you because something in their brain unconsciously said hey you should click on that you can't track that that's just the reality of it now what you can do for some of the traditional marketing which is where it becomes more difficult to track because not everything's online is on your billboards on your vans on your trucks whatever it may be uh, the phone number that should be on there, you should have a specific phone number for that. So you can track, okay, great. Or tracking number, uh, I use CallRail. I typically recommend it, but there's hundreds of platforms you can use. You should have a specific number that's just our van. Now, they could still visit your website and call that number. Sure, but if they decide to call the number that they see on the van right there, you'll be able to track that or your billboard, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. What you can also do, uh, same thing applies for radio as well, of course. Uh, so what you can also do is have a different website that you put on your van, your um, oh. your billboards, et cetera. Now, the issue with this is that when it comes to brandability, some people have vanity numbers. Some people have, uh, you know, they're not just like, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they they have a specific brand name for their plumbing company, their HVAC company, whatever it may be, rather than something a little bit more generic in terms of their URL. Well, what you can do is you can you can go out and register, uh, you know. Uh, Atlanta hvac.com, uh, you know, uh, whatever it may be, right? And then you can send people to that website. That website automatically redirects them to your main website, but you can track how many people entered that website, then went to your website. So these are some of the ways you can kind of get around it. But at the end of the day, it's still going to be challenging because the less direct it is, the more difficult it is to really track. Yeah. But you're not looking for perfect data, you're looking for good enough data. You should never look at your, uh, let's say your Google Analytics in terms of traffic and go, okay, great, we had 213 people on our website. No, you should look at that and go, okay, great, we had we had more people than last quarter, last right. month, whatever it may be. You're looking more so at trends rather than the exact number. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> but whenever they, when you say someone is not tracking versus tracking mm-hmm. is there certain platform that you're that you're using for tracking that so that you can you can say look we know what roi we're getting for mm-hmm. each one of these marketing things and is is there something specific that we need to be doing there yeah sure so when it comes to roi the thing that, that i find um really interesting about it is that if you talk to anyone uh, that is pitching marketing in the contracting field, I'm sure you get like 20 cold emails a day uh, from people (laughs) pitching you uh, really uh, poorly crafted emails, but everyone talks about ROI. Hey, great. You know, at least they should be, if they're talking about, Hey, you're going to get more traffic clicks. Mm -hmm. They probably aren't really worth it. They probably don't know what they're doing a lot, but you should be talking about ROI. ROI is what the talking should be should be about all you care about is what do I put in? What do I get out? Now the issue is most of what actually determines if you get ROI has nothing to do with the actual marketing company that you have hired because Mm -hmm. all the, your Google ad that gives you clicks, your website that gives you leads, your sales team is what turns that into sales. Your fulfillment team is what gets them to come back and actually retain them as a customer and actually write positive reviews about you and so on. So, when it comes to ROI, yes, we want to do everything we can to improve it. And I'll get into the details in a second, but it's very important to understand that there's a lot of the equation that happens on the business end rather than the marketing agency or even your marketing employee if you have an in-house employee doing that for you. So when it comes to tracking, some things, again, would be more so on our front versus on your front. First thing, anything online, the basics are set up for you. It's already it's automatically going to track your clicks and website bits, right? So let's take Google Ads for an example because most people have run Google Ads. Uh, at some point in time. Mm-hmm. So somebody clicks on your ad, Google ads tracks that automatically, comes to your website, you're probably using Google Analytics as well. Most people are using that, so you can track the traffic. Okay, great. Now the next thing you need to track are conversions. Form conversions, most people have that set up. You can either set up through Google Analytics, Google Tag Manager. If you're using Google ads, you can set up through tracking codes. I'm gonna keep that brief because you can just Google how to do that stuff and it's pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. The next thing, which I would say maybe 30, 40% of the people that I talked to actually have that set up is call tracking. That's the next level is using a platform like Calra, which is what we recommend to and what we use ourselves to actually track these phone calls. Now there's a couple things you can do with something like Calra is one of the things that's really cool is that if somebody visits your website on their desktop computer, picks up their mobile phone, a device that's never been on your website, and then calls the number that they see on your website, 
call rail will be able to tell you that that person called you because of a PPC ad that you were running. They do this through what's called DNI or dynamic number insertion. If you use call rail, I recommend setting up. Basically, it just automatically swaps your real phone number with a tracking number uh, when somebody accesses your website and it gives you a specific number based on where that person came in from so that they can actually track that. And so what happens is you have that set up, then you need to make sure it's connected. So th through the integrations of CallRail, it's super easy to set up. You just uh, set up their Google Ads integration. And now within your Google Ads account, you can track your actual conversions for phone calls. And your CallRail account, you have basically your hub of where all the, uh, all the calls came from. So that's the next level that everyone should have uh, set up that, again, well, maybe 30, 40% of the time they have it set up. Now, here's where uh, the next level that people don't, typically don't have. Pretty much everyone will have some sort of CRM some sort of customer database, whatever it may be. Now the issue is the connectivity of the lead generation to that CRM. And now depending on what you're using is gonna depend on how this is going to set up. They might have a native integration with something like CallRail and Google Analytics for tracking that, or you might have to hire a developer to build that integration for you. Mm. Luckily, hiring developers, super easy. Go to Upwork.com, you can find a ton of them. It's not very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And most of these tools comes with built-in APIs. And what that means is that it's very easy and very straightforward for someone to build you a custom connection so that your call rail account can talk to your CRM. And so what should happen is depending on how this is set up, how your systems and processes are, it might be partly manual process, it could be completely automated, but you get a you get a call from Sarah. She has, you know, she needs a new, uh, you know, a, a new heater installed or mm -hmm. Georgia, probably not. She needs a new <laughs> AC installed. So, you know, AC is kind of old, uh, keeps breaking down. She needs a new one installed. So great. You write down her information, you put it into your CRM. Well, you now know her phone number. If it does not automatically do that, your team should be going into call row, looking for that phone number. Okay, great. It's there. What was that source? And then within your CRM, either within a custom field or a built-in one, again, depending on what you're using, depends on what you have, uh, you should be able to indicate this person called in from here. Now, ideally, that happens automatically where call rail is automatically looking for a new um, uh, a new uh, contact added to your CRM and it looks for that number just makes it easier, but at the very least, someone should manually be going through and matching the leads you got to the actual conversions. Okay, great, this person was a form conversion on our website. You can track form conversions by source, by setting up hidden fields, talk to whoever manages your forms, and they can do that for you so you can actually track where the person came in from, where they were um, filled with the form. And so basically now what you're doing is your CRM is telling you how many new leads you got, which you're probably already looking at anyways, but also where those leads came from. Right. And then you can look at those individual sources to look at how, how much money did you spend on those sources. And now you can track not just leads generated from source, but customers generated from source. Because what we can see on our end is I can see you got 20 phone calls this month. Great. I cannot see how many of those actually turned into jobs. I cannot see how was that a small job that was like $200 or is that a $20,000 commitment or was that a $1 million roofing job that you just got from a local uh, uh, commercial space, right? So that's where the conversation is uh, very talking about ROI becomes a lot more difficult because I actually can't see your numbers, right. right? I can see your lead gen. Right. Yeah. So that's why it's really important to track that on your end. And then just through your normalcy around tracking, you should be tracking depending on what people have access to and who you want to see stuff, you should be tracking within there. Are they a customer? How much have they spent with you for each individual transaction? So you can mm -hmm. see over time your retention rate, but also, so for example, the average HVAC customer is worth about $50,000 over their lifetime adjusted for inflation. So you should be able to see, okay, great. You know, we spent, it cost us $500 to acquire this customer and their first job was $200 with them, but they have also hired us four more times for that. And we've made $10,000 in profit off of them. Mm -hmm. And then from there, just, Profit margins, you can see, okay, great. Here's our gross, look at your PL, here's our average profit margin. We did thirty thousand dollars from Google Ads, uh, 30% profit margin, nine thousand dollars in profit. We spent five grand. Okay, great, we made four grand. Yeah. So are you tracking every single time they call in? Like uh so let's say that uh, okay, let's give an example of I have a an HVAC system change out, and we're gonna change out this system. They have and they they get our let's say it's our website phone number, our mm -hmm. header phone number off of one of the landing pages. Uh, it's a call tracking number. They save that call tracking number in their phone. So every time they call us, they call from that call tracking number. Um, do you see that happen very often? And does that kind of stuff skew the numbers very often? Cause they're, so they're going to go through the whole project and they may call the office three or four times. Maybe mm -hmm. if it's a long project it could be five or six times. And then, so you're getting, you know, 
you know, six phone calls and it might be a 12 or $20,000 job. And, um, so I imagine something like that may skew it a little bit, but do you see that very often happen that way? So to know whether or not they do something like save the number on their phone, I can't really speak to because I don't right, know what they're, yeah. right, right. they're doing. But this is uh, this kind of uh, goes back to uh, what I mentioned earlier. The data isn't perfect, and you're more so looking at uh, you know roughly what is what is it doing. Mm -hmm. So your CRM will tell you that okay, you'll be able to see in call route that this person has called you five, six times and your CRM or whatever connection you're doing automatically or manually, you would already know that they're a customer. Mm -hmm. So you would know on your end that you wouldn't be attributing your revenue for that because you have that. Now, uh, on the technical side of how CallRail works, uh, for someone like CallRail, uh, how many numbers you want to have is gonna be dependent on how much traffic you get. So the minimum is four for the dynamic number insertion. If you get a good amount of traffic, you might want to increase that to eight, 16, 20. If you do a lot of marketing, if you're a sizable company, you might want like 30 to 50 numbers. Mm -hmm. The reason being is that if you have, let's say a very limited number of numbers, four numbers, 10 people come to your website at once, those 10 people have, that four numbers are split between those 10 people. And so if somebody does save that number, let's say it's a 555 number, right? And so if I save that 555 number, and then somebody clicks on your ad from Google ads and within a certain period of time within before that number is shown to a different user. If I then call that 555 number, it will say that it came in from Google ads because there's no way for the system to know. However, it's not going to be very uh, often that that happens. Okay. So it's just not going to be perfect. But again, there's no way to really, uh, you know, the alternative is just to not have that data whatsoever. Right. <laughs> yeah. And if you're doing, if you're, if you're, breaking it down that deep and that far mm -hmm. you're way ahead of the game as far as right everybody else that's, that's tracking the roi so all right that's cool I, I mean i like that and then you say in improving your roi and i i think a lot of what i took out of that is a lot of like what our coaches use um we use a a, a business coach group um out of mm -hmm. new jersey it's CEO warrior and they their biggest thing is is you know when you ask all right, so what um, what should our conversion rate be or what should our percentages be for sales and everything else? And they're like, mm -hmm. well, what was it last month? And they're like, well, that's what I, not what I want to know. I want to know what the industry standard is. Like, no, mm -hmm. whatever last month was, let's just improve on that. Let's get it better mm -hmm. from last month. And, and I think that that's kind of what you were saying about the ROI and, and even uh, improving that over, over the time period. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, so... To a certain extent, I do think that you should focus on where your numbers are because it's very hard to compare against someone else, especially if you're comparing yourself against like the, mm -hmm. you know, you're the new HVAC company, you, you've you been a technician for the past 10, 15 years, and now you just started now you're handling the phones yourself for the first time in your life and you're competing against the $4 million company that has an army of salespeople. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, your sales skills probably suck compared to theirs because they have decades of experience in systems and processes and you're just figuring this out. Yep. So yes, I would 100% say you need to focus on uh, on what you're doing, uh, but more so uh, the issue that, or the the challenge, or or rather the real opportunity I see for businesses that understand this is that your ROI, how much money you make from what you put into your marketing, is not based on how cheaply you can get clicks or what percentage of people you can convert. It's everything that happens from the point of you getting a click to every transaction you ever have with that person and how many referrals they ever give you in their in the lifetime they're being a customer, whether or not they leave you positive reviews because, hey, they leave your one-star review, that other person that you just paid $30 a click for may decide not to call you because of that one-star review, yeah. right? And so... I'm going to, I'm going to throw out a lot of numbers here. I'm going to try to do it fairly uh, quickly so I can get through it. So for anybody watching, you may need to listen to this part a couple times because there's a lot that I want to cover in a short period of time. Yeah. All right. So buckle up. Let's say you're doing something like Google ads. Again, I use Google ads as an example. Those are the two things we do SEO, Google ads. Uh, however, most people have run Google ads and it's a lot less moving parts. Uh, it's a lot more straightforward. Let's say you spend $5,000 a month on Google ads and each click costs you $30 you would get 167 clicks. Let's say you get 10% conversion rate, that'd be 17 conversions roughly. Let's say your sales team closes at 30%, there'd be about five new customers. Let's say on average, the lifetime value, if you don't know what lifetime value is, uh, you know, go ahead and look that up. But let's say the lifetime value of your customer is $10,000, that would be $50,000 in new revenue over the lifetime of those five new customers. Let's say you have a net profit of 30%, that'd be $15,000 in net profit. So you spent five, you'll make 15, that's a 300% ROI. Now, let's just say that that's the baseline of what you're doing. Let's say that's the average advertising in your space mm -hmm. so 
what most people then do is they go, okay, great. We, if we want to improve our ROI, we need to lower our cost per click. We need to improve our conversion rate. You know, but what happens is these are the most difficult things to improve because that's what everybody is focused on. Yeah. Everybody is yelling at their agency. Hey, I need cheaper clicks. Everybody is complaining to the web developers. Hey, I need a higher conversion rate. That's what everyone's doing. And uh, it, it's the most competitive to really focus on it. But what happens if we break down each of those individual sections, and I have the math on the screen here, which is why I'm looking over here. But let's say we break down each of those individual sections and we make marginal improvements to every situation. And I'll even explain a couple of different ways that you might be able to do this. So let's say your cost per click goes from $30 to $28, pretty small change. And you could do that because you, let's say you improved your quality scores or you cut out some keywords that were spending a lot of money but weren't really generating conversions. Lots of different things that might happen there. So you make a marginal improvement from 30 to 28. That's 179 clicks up from 167. Let's say your conversion rate, 10% conversion rate for service-based business, you're looking for about 10 to 20%. If it's a more emergency service, maybe 20, 30%. If it's a very competitive area, you might be looking at about half those uh, rates just because people are going to uh, price check a lot more. Mm -hmm. So let's say you go from a 10 to 15% conversion rate. I would say that's a pretty marginal improvement from 10 to 15% because it's still very much so in the realm of possibility. I would say 15 to 20% would be a pretty big improvement, but I'd say 10 to 15 is pretty marginal. You're going to do that because you ran some tests. You changed your headline. You made your call to actions a little bit more clear, your buttons. You, you actually made your phone number stand out. Your phone number should be very big, top right of your website. It should not be hidden at the bottom or anything like that. So it should be very clear how they convert. Okay, great. You went from 10 to 15% conversion rate. Your sales rate, let's say you go from 30% to 35%, still in the realm of possibility. Most contractors that I talk to, anywhere with the actual numbers, not what they actually say that they are, because they always say it's like 89%. Right. The actual numbers, <laughs> I'll find anywhere between 20% uh, percent on the lower end and 40, 45% on the, we have a just a kick ass sales team end. Yeah. So let's say you go from 30 to 35%. How? You sit down with your, your people at least once a quarter. You're, actually, you're using call row. You're recording your calls. You're sitting down with your sales team. You're going over the calls. Here's how we can improve. Here's the systems and processes we can put in place so that when Bill's answering the phone, it's just as consistent as when Jack is answering your phone. You know, Bill leaves. He's a great salesperson. We're not screwed because he wasn't the only person that actually knew how to do, do the job in the business. Exactly. So you're creating systems and processes. You're improving the quality of your team. Uh, you're sitting down. You're hiring sales coaches. You're telling them, hey, you know, please tear apart our sales processes. Make us look like complete idiots and help us build it up, right? Uh, if you want to get really advanced, fly your team off to that Yes, that $5,000 sales event, it's pretty expensive. Yes, it's going to cost you 10, 15K to send your entire team and house uh, uh, lodging and everything like that. But you're also going to walk away with that. And maybe that 10, 15K that you invested is going to end up being an extra $100,000 a year for your business. So proving your sales team, you go from 30, 35% completely within the realm of possibility. Let's say on the revenue, uh, it's a little bit harder to do so, but you increase your lifetime value. Let's say you go very marginally from 10,000 to 11,000. This is you increase your prices, or maybe you get them to come back for an extra job or two. You get you do an upsell for something or whatever it may be. Uh, so you go from 10,000 to 11,000 on average in revenue. Let's say your net profit, you go from 30 to 32%. Again, once a quarter, you should be sitting down with your accountant and everyone on your team. What's everything that we pay for on a recurring basis? What do we not need? Does anybody actually use this tool anymore? Do we need to lower our plan or the software? Uh, you know, do we actually need this additional cost? Whatever it may be, right? So let's say, again, you go from marginal improvement from 30 to 32%. So here's what we've done. We've lowered our cost per click from $30 to 28, improved our conversion rate from 10 to 15, improved our sales rates from 30 to 35, improved our lifetime value from 10,000 to 11,000, improved our net profit from 30% to 32%, all within the realm of possibility. You went from making $15,000 in profit to $33,000 in profit, which is a change from a 300% ROI to a 660% ROI. And we haven't even done a whole lot other than marginal changes. We yeah. could push that a lot further. You could drop the cost per click by an extra dollar, improve conversion rate to 20%, improve sales rate to 40%, improve lifetime value to 12 and a half grand, improve net profit to 35%, all within the realm of possibility. And now you're making $64,000 after spending that five grand, which means you went from a 300% to a 1300% ROI. And everyone focuses on the clicks and the conversions, most people don't look at the sales team, the lifetime value of the customers, and the actual net profit of the business, which is where the 80% of the actual ROI comes from. Yeah, I love that because I, I, that's the thing that that most people don't even track. And like we were talking about earlier, even with the call tracking and listening to phone calls, listening to the recordings mm -hmm. and going back. And, and it's cringeworthy a lot of times, especially when you first start doing it and you're like, oh, 
I wouldn't answer. I wouldn't buy from that person. You know, when you're listening to your own phone conversation, um, I, I I love all of that. It's so much. Whoever's listening to this or watching this, <laughs> you're gonna have to pause it and rewind it a couple of times because it's it's so much information. But it's it's real information, and it's what we really need to hear. It's a gut check for a lot of us because. Um, that outbounding after the fact, that's a huge thing. Like all this money that's being left on the table and, and uh, these people want things, but maybe in the, in the moment, it's just like it was 108 degrees here yesterday, day before yesterday. And so it's legitimately like, they're just like, let's just get some air going in the house. Hmm. But in reality, they needed some duct work rep replaced or repaired. They needed some other things. They needed a little float switch or something else. And, and having that team follow up after the fact, like that's just, that's money that is being left on the table. And that goes straight to the bottom line because you don't have to go back and, you know, pay for more clicks to get that outbounding. And so there's a lot of stuff like that. There's, there's little things that are just um, not, um, people don't really take advantage of and they don't really track it. And then they're going to blame you. You're the first person to get blamed. Mm -hmm. like, why am I spending $2,500 every single month? And like my, my conversion rate's horrible. Like my ROI is next to nothing. I'm not even getting $2,500 back or whatever the case may be. And right. uh, I think that's, that you hit the nail on the head right there. I mean, it's not to pass the buck, but that's mm -hmm. a rightful buck to pass because there are definitely, when you listen to conversations and you see like people, people will have their phones go straight to their cell phones and like, and I get it as a smaller contractor, like you're one guy in a truck and your phones come to your cell phone. You're answering the phones in between, like you're trying to answer them while you're in an attic or something like that. Um, it's not that expensive to hire a call center and have the call center answer the phone and convert it. And they're like, that's their job is to convert it to a, a, a lead and uh versus going sending people to voicemail like you can't you can't sell anything by sending the people to voicemail and so yeah I, I like it that's that's a ton of ton of value jared thank you so much for everything that you get i mean there's just there was so much information there uh you're gonna have to listen to this episode a couple of times because <laughs> of all of that um but if they want to learn more about you and your business what uh what's the best way for that to happen where where do we reach out to you yeah, sure. So before I say that, the last thing that I will say is, yes, it's not about passing the buck. It's about clear and honest communication. That is what makes the difference. I can guarantee you that that's the biggest factor in our business. How long we retain people is communication. Make sure who you're working with understands the stuff that I said and make sure that you're having open communication on what happens after you get that lead and what those numbers actually are. Your conversations with your marketing team should or agency should not be how many clicks do we get? It should be, hey, great. You know, you said we got 50 leads that great. We got this many clients. That's going to be worth this to us. Right. So with that being said, uh, the way you can find me is if you go to team blue dog.com T E A M blue dog.com. That is the agency website from there. I invite you to check out the content. Honestly, there's not a whole lot on there, but if you check out the content, every con piece of content that I have on there does link to the YouTube channel where there's a lot more content. It is explicit. So if you're a little bit uh, worried about the language, probably don't check that out, to be honest. Uh, but you know, I have much more content on YouTube. You'll be able to easily find it there. Google my name if you want to know more about me. And uh, okay. my, yeah, so I'm not gonna, there's no hard pitch here. Just come check out the content. If you're like, hey, you know, you seem pretty smart, then yeah, let's, let's strike up a conversation. Cool, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for everything. And thank you, anybody that's watching this, listening to this um, Service Business Mastery Podcast. It is the podcast focused on service business owners, managers, and technicians who are considering becoming business owners. My goal here is to answer the unasked questions, and I hope that uh, today's episode did that. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to reach out to Jared or myself. Um, and uh, if you can't remember who it was, just, just, uh, send me a text message or email and say, Hey, the guy that was talking really fast. They gave out so much information <laughs> <laughs> and I'll know exactly what you're talking about. But anyways, have a great day and uh, I hope to talk to you again soon.